for sure. So welcome to our Friday Five Live. Um, I am just so thrilled um, to be here with you all as we have important conversations once again with Dan Maxwell. Dan, we really, really um, appreciate your, your time today. Um, if you are joining us live, make sure you do introduce yourself in the chat and we'd love to have questions um, from our audience. So feel free to put that in the chat. Um, you can also enable uh, closed captioning for um, today's session. So welcome um, everyone, happy Friday. Um, it's the summer, we're all a little warm. We're hoping Dan has air conditioning in Houston. Um, Dan uh, Maxwell is joining us again. Um, he is currently at the University of Houston um, where he serves, um, I believe you're still serving in dual roles. Is that correct? I, I have, a, have, have been bumped up to um, interim vice chancellor and interim vice president for student affairs. I'm sorry, we, we need to make sure we get those titles correct because those are big ones. Um, and just Dan is so well connected with NASPA and with other professional associations and has provided just a wealth of resources um, to our Friday Five Live um, audience over the last year or so. So Dan, thank you so much for agreeing to be with us. Um, and as I mentioned, we hope you're staying cool because heard all about the concerns about the electrical grid in Houston and to, or in Texas in general. So we are, we are doing well today. Today is a good day. <laughs> That's then we'll just roll with that. We're going to roll with that. Well, this conversation all came about because um, in, in, in Dan's role, he just really has always insp it's inspired me in our time working together um, with the way that, you know, you think about students and how you're interacting and really listening to students and student needs. And so um, recently in the last year or so on LinkedIn, I've seen a couple of your posts regarding this initiative about donuts with Dr. Dan and um, just it, it just great photos of, you know, you um, interacting, engaging with students. But I think it's such an important um, conversation that we've had repeatedly on our Friday Five Lives this year about making those connections with students. How are we really authentically listening to students? Um, you know, unfortunately we continue to see pretty grim statistics around student mental health in college, um, certainly at all levels, but, but we're gonna focus on college and, um, you know, concern about it, enrollment numbers and students dropping out of inst or, or institutions. So to kick us off, I would really love to hear about your Donuts with Dr. Dan initiative, which my children think sounds to me. We're, we're real donut fans in our house. Um, and kind of share with us how you came to that and then what are you finding as a result of that? Sure, so um, I've been at the University of Aaron, uh, Houston um, for 11 years. And as I shared with you um, in October, um, the vice president and vice chancellor at the time um, was uh, accepted the opportunity to be the interim president at UH Clear Lake, which is one of our system schools in the UH system. And the chancellor asked me to step up to be the interim vice chancellor, vice president for student affairs. And um, as I began the role, one of the things that I had realized um, was it's, it's very easy not to be connected with students when you move up in administration because you're supervising departments, you're supervising the staff, you're looking at strategic plans. And the thing, the thing that got us into this field was, was working with students. Sometimes you have to be much more intentional about as you move up. Um, and, and most vice presidents, um, vice chancellors on their campuses will meet on a regular basis with student government. And, and I started doing that immediately. And uh, it's something that the previous vice chancellor and vice president did. So I meet every two weeks with the president and vice president of SGA. But I also realized there's a lot of students, a lot of student organizations, a lot of voices that um, I'm, I'm waiting for other people to share that with me. So I thought, why not just get out there myself, um, create opportunities where I can sit with students um, for an hour, really low key. Um, the, the whole goal was simply, um, this, is, this is who I am. This is what student affairs is on this campus because a lot of times people don't know who reports to who, they don't understand which departments are in which divisions. So I basically share with folks kind of, What's the division of student affairs? These are the departments that, are, that I interface with and I hopefully are interfacing with you. And really what I wanna know is what's your experience like here at the University of Houston? And how can we do a, a better job in helping you stay connected and have a really positive 
student life experience while you're here. And so I didn't want it to be overly complicated. Um, the groups are usually between um, eight to 15 students because I also don't want people to feel like, how am I going to, how, how is he going to hear my voice in a group of, of, of 100 people? So we, um, we schedule them about every uh, two to three weeks. We identify populations of students. And so this past semester, I had an opportunity to sit with first generation students, students who they out of foster care. Um, I sat with students who are part of our Cougars and Recovery Program. Um, I sat with our commuter students. Uh, I sat with veteran students. Uh, I sat with a, a number of our student leaders um, from some of our um, African American and Latino student organizations as well. Um, and we're starting to think about plans for next year. And again, just creating a space where we can sit and talk with each other. And so they know that they're being heard about the things that matter to them. And I've heard all kinds of topics, <laughs> areas that don't fall within my realm of responsibility to areas that are specifically within the Division of Student Affairs. So, very eye-opening, um, very candid conversations. Um, and it's just been really helpful for me to hear directly from students and not filter through other student leaders or staff. Did you provide um, some kind of guiding questions to help kick the, off the conversation? Or did you find students were just like, oh, here we go. Like, I have been waiting to talk to you, Dr. Dan. <laughs> It's really just, um, again, wanting them to know kind of why are we here? And it's really very basic. I'm here because I want to hear from you about what your experience is like at the University of Houston. Good, bad, whatever it may be. Um, because I, I've always taken the philosophy of if we've offered you admissions to our institution, we're already telling you that, that we think that you can be successful and graduate. And so I know that some of our students connect with academics immediately in their classrooms with their faculty. And I know that some students need some kind of um, Velcro that keeps them connected to the institution a little bit longer while they build their capacity to get connected academically. And I think the things that we do in the co-curricular and student affairs student services can be that, um, that sticky piece, right? The piece that helps them stay connected to the institution while they build their capacity. So. Um, I really just wanted them to, to share with me what it was like to be on campus, what things made it a better experience for them, and are there things we could be doing better to um, enhance that experience? I just love that metaphor of being the Velcro, Dan. Um, there was some great research, uh, there was a great article that Chronicle, I think, maybe put out this week, but other news sources have picked up around. Um, the importance of um, engagement in the class and helping students feel belong, specifically focused on the academics, right? I think we talk a lot in student services about helping students find a place of belonging. Yeah. But this research is really, that the, the Chronicle wrote about is really focused on the classroom experience. Um, and I was excited to see that because I, I, I kind of think like you, right? I think sometimes our student affairs folks are the are the kind of first pieces of Velcro to use your term. And we need that Velcro as well in the classroom setting too. Yeah, I mean, Tinto talks a lot about the need to connect students with that academic and faculty um, experience. And so uh, he talks about things that, you know, you need to be doing in the classroom with clear expectations of what success looks like and the sense of connecting to the content and feeling like it matters that you show up to the class. And I think the reality is, is that's what we need to be doing for all of our students is that it matters that you're here. It matters that you said yes to our invitation to become a student. And because it matters, we want to create the spaces where you will always feel connected um, so that you will persist and thrive and graduate. And we know that that's not always the experience of some of our students, but if we're not going to talk to them directly about how we make the experience better uh, within the context of our resources, then, um, we, we, you know, I guess part of us, what, what are we doing, right? <laughs> we, we want them to be here, we want them to be successful, we want them to be successful in the classroom. But we know that, that, that some of this growth 
and a spiritual learning happens outside of the classroom. So how do we complement the academic thriving with the personal growth that, that takes place? The holistic approach of, of college, I think is important. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really a nice segue to this kind of next question around, you know, you and I have spoken and we've um, had um, a pretty powerful um, podcast episode, I think in May around this concern around student disengagement and that, you know, faculty and staff are talking a lot about, writing a lot about, reporting um, disengagement. And I didn't know if there's anything outside of Dr., you know, Donuts with Dr. Dan that you feel like really has helped um, around this idea of student and disengagement and addressing those or other initiatives you're seeing at, at maybe other places. I mean, I think the reality is, is we have two cohorts that have not had traditional experiences. So we recognize that our current sophomores did not have a typical freshman year in college. And we recognize that our current freshmen didn't have a typical senior year in high school. Um, they were online um, where they would connect in activities and classrooms. They were doing it all virtually. Um, and to the credit of our faculty colleagues, I mean, it's a skill set to teach online. And, um, you know, it's, it's a different type of pedagogy. And so when you think about someone who is used to teaching in a classroom um, to then all of a sudden being online, uh, I think people did the best that they could, but was it still that experience that somebody was looking for in college? Um, we note that our students benefit greatly by being in an in-person orientation program because they hear from peers about the urgency to follow, you know, the timelines and to meet the deadlines and to get registered and um, and ways to get connected on campus. Um, we're just seeing the with both our current sophomores and our freshmen, they're waiting to the last minute to, to take care of some of the business to, to get ready to go to the next school year. And maybe like they're waiting for the last minute to register. They're waiting for the last minute to make sure the bills get paid. It could simply be that they're waiting for the next shoe to drop, having experienced COVID for two years, and they don't want to get their hopes up. Now, that's a little anecdotal there, but I, I do think that they've missed out on some experiences that help to shape what the four or five year experience looks like at a, at a college, a traditional college. And so when we brought our, our new freshmen back, we opened up some very traditional types of activities for our sophomores. So during orientation, in-person orientation, we have this one event on the first night where all the students who are participating in orientation kind of uh, circle around one of our very large fountains and we give them candles and we teach them the alma mater and they sing it a couple of times. Um, and, you know, I don't know that everybody's walking away having memorized it and ready to sing it at the next football game, but it's a, it's a shared experience about being in college and specifically being at our institution. Um, we, we had a prom uh, this fall, and we had over, uh, over 300 students show up. Um, and, you know, here's students who, and they were mostly freshmen and sophomores, but here's students who missed that other high school prom because of the COVID experience. So we had students show up in all kinds of, of, of wear, and some of them probably wearing what they would have worn if they'd gone to their own high school prom. And they, you know, how many times do we think about hosting a dance in our, in our student union? But, you know, the students just, they crave some of these kind of quote unquote normal activities or experiences that they have missed out on. So I think trying to rebuild relationships is critical. Um, I think trying to demonstrate to the students that we're invested in them having experiences that feel like college. And even so, some of that is being redefined. Um, I don't know that it, that you know Meg is about going back to going back to normal and going back to what it was because I don't know that what it was was perfect either. Um, but I do know that we learned a lot in uh, the pandemic, and uh, one of the things we learned a lot was the, the that connection, those physical connections, that being in space together um, really is important. Um, as people choose to build relationships and who they choose to build those relationships with, creating opportunities where they can connect is critical. And I think I think your point about the relationship building, and you know, I think we've really seen what happens when we can't do that, right? 
um, and 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 the challenges that create emotion. I mean, just um, all kinds of things we could go into. But I'm I think this ties so nicely into this kind of next question around. Um, in June, we had a podcast around declining college enrollment numbers, and I know. You know, certainly that's not the case at all institutions. I certainly don't think it's the case from what little I've read about the University of Houston. Um, but it is happening in a lot of places. Um, and so I'm curious about building on this idea of kind of relationships as we think about retention um, and initiatives, because I, you, you built, make such a good point. Uh, we are in this continued place of kind of transition, right, figuring out what education is going to look like, and and I really love that you say it didn't. We shouldn't go back to what we did necessarily because what we did wasn't working for everybody. I think there's some really important lessons we've learned in the last couple of years. I don't want us to throw those away, um, but but thinking about how we are coming back together in these very intentional places and. I'm amazed at the University of Houston. I mean, it's, you're not a small school and to draw everybody together during freshman orientation and light candles and sing, I mean, you know. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that we're seeing this year is because we, we are, we came back to um, doing in-person. Um, all of our orientation sessions are in-person. Our freshman or first time in college experiences are two day um, overnight required stay. Um, our, transfer students are one day. Um, we closed out our, our June and half of our July sessions in early June. Like people, students were excited to be back on campus. They wanted to be back. When we started doing our uh, campus tours, um, you know, we, we, I think we were pretty in innovative in regards to how we were doing them online because they were, um, there were various videos that were um, live streamed. And so the, the tour guide was online with a group of people and they were personally showcasing and talking about the different spaces that they were showing on the video. So there was still that human connection. Um, but when we moved back to being in person, um, they filled up and they filled up fast. I mean, we, we still offered, I think, two or three orientation sessions for folks who are 300 miles or further out. Um, and of course, there's always exceptions to the rule. But we know that for us, students, when they come to our campus and they see what it's all about, that's the tipping point for us. And we also know that um, them being on campus, they get a real feel for who we are versus just what they think we may be. Um, so it's really critical that we have a, a number of interactive um, activities that are going on, that they're in small groups with their orientation leaders, they are having opportunities to engage and stay in the residence halls overnight. Um, and then we showcase um, our student organizations with them on that first evening as well. Our student government president this year is fantastic and really about school spirit. Um, and again, giving people some reason to be excited about being physically at school. I, I think it's, we've missed them and they missed us. And we know that we do it much better when we're in person. And that really speaks to your incoming students. Any, any efforts that you see retention I've uh, you know I've had some colleagues really talk about you know this year's this this year's freshman class who are now rising sophomores right had a more typical in person we got to you know kind of put our hands on them be be together I, I've heard a lot of concern around particularly the sophomore class that's now rising juniors because they started off in a pandemic and really didn't have any of those kind of touch points um, on campus? Yeah, I think what we, I mean, one of the things that we learned through the pandemic is that when we went virtual, um, we actually reached some people that we weren't connected with before. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we came back onto campus um, this past fall, um, there was this really, there was this kind of pull and tug of, well, do we have to bring everything back? in person? Can we have a hybrid approach? And, you know, we recognize that um, there are certain things that are possible that would continue to reach the folks who weren't physically coming to campus by remain, remaining hybrid. It also allows some folks to, um, you know, for them, the hybrid was a more comfortable experience for them. Maybe it was counseling or 
uh, doing a, a medical um, uh, conversation with their doctor. Um, but we also know that we lost some people by not being here because they weren't in safe spaces to have conversations. So mm -hmm. we, we've really kind of been watching this whole year, the in interaction with trying to offer what we offer what we do in a hazard situation to, to connect with as many people as possible so that folks don't have the excuse, I'm not sure how I'm going to get connected, right? So, um, but, you know, one of the things I learned from my donor, Dr. Dan, I, you know, I was one of the students I met with early on, she was a sophomore and she was like, this is my first semester on the campus. She goes, I, I was home all of my freshman year and, and the first part of my sophomore year. And so, I'm now on campus and I'm having a hard time figuring out where I'm supposed to go. I want to go to club meetings to meet other students, but half the student organizations are still meeting online. Um, but I think, you know, people are still trying to mitigate what's best in the current environment to stay connected. Um, I, I, I think the retention piece is really critical that returning students and and that's why I think I brought up that point earlier from our current freshman and our sophomore class. They're not moving as quickly as they used to move. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to see the outcome of our incoming students, our incoming freshman class who have experienced orientation um, on, on campus, meeting with academic advisors in person, um, participating in the activities, learning about deadlines and the importance of not being on time and being ahead of it. And how do you own this experience? I think some of that is taught during orientation. Um, but, but, you know, we do continue to watch the behavior of our returning students, our continuing students, and to your point that our current sophomores rising to be juniors and our current freshmen rising to be sophomores. Um, they're just not doing it as quickly as before. And then, you know, I think going from the pandemic, the health pandemic, and now talking about the economy, we have students who might normally would have been with us in the summer to kind of get ahead of the, the game, but need to opt out of summer education to work. So um, I know it's higher ed, like everybody's has, has the one, two hit, uh, first the health pandemic and now the economy. And I think we're just trying to figure out how do we get our programs and services to our students where they are today with the things that they're trying to navigate and mitigate so that they can, can see a way to continue moving forward. They can see a way to continue to finish their degree, um, which I think is, it's some of our responsibility to figure out how to be nimble and how we deliver our programs and services. And, and I think the economy is such an important thing to bring up because, you know, I know in, in a largely working at community college, right, we, we don't have residence halls. I did once have a mom try to move a student in. I was like, I'm sorry, <laughs> that is not an option here. Um, but the cost of gasoline, you know, these things are really impacting our students as they're making decisions about what their fall will look like um, and certainly what summer enrollment which then impacts right the, the degree progress moving forward and so uh, I, I think your message of one of connection and helping students to see that there is a path the you know and and that institutions right it goes back to the, the whole point of our conversation today is listening to students, that students, that, that institutions are aware, right? That I, and I, I know that sounds silly. I mean, institutions are painfully aware of increased cost, right? I mean, it impacts everything. Um, but I think sometimes our students don't recognize or are not being told, we, we see this going on in your community. We, we understand how this is impacting, you know, we care about you, we're here supporting you. Yeah, I, I think we also have to remember that, um, you know, we have to make sure that our students understand what their options are and not make the assumption that because we put it out in a campus communication or that it's on the website, that they fully know um, what their options are or, or what the, what the availability is for certain services, whether it be hybrid or in person. Um, you know, I, it's always interesting when, you know, when, when folks have opportunities to talk with other administrators or other student leaders, and then what comes back, what comes back to me is the students that know about, you know, your Saturday night program. And then I go and I look at all the promotion and advertising 
that the department did to put out you know, information about infrared and you know ice skating on campus or the, the circus that came to campus. And people are like, I didn't know about that. And I'm thinking, we really do need to figure out how to promote opportunities in multiple mediums, which can be time consuming. You know, you think is it, <laughs> yeah, is it, is it TikTok, is it Instagram? Um, you know, it, it's, it's not Facebook because that's what the parents are watching. And, you know, it, is it a poster every now and then someplace? Is it yard signs? Um, is it word of mouth? And I think all those things are critical in getting the information out to the students and recognizing that they are receiving it in different ways from different mediums. And there's not just one way to tell the story about what's available to you. That's such great advice and that we have to be willing to be creative and nimble, I think, in having those convert, like sharing that information. Right. Um, and sometimes I've worked with teams where people are very, I'm just going to say this, judgmental about, well, students don't read their email. Like you, you can't hide behind that. I think we have to meet students where they are or what's the point of having these kinds of programs. I mean, who, who wants to read a, an email that goes beyond the screen? Right. Right, you know, I, I mean, I, I'm reminded of that all the time. It's like, Dan, concise to the point, even the staff that want to read email that's, you know, longer than the screen size, and you know, and how you message on TikTok versus Instagram are very different, and you know, how people get that information is received differently. And so, you know, again, let's talk with our students and ask them what's the best way to get this information to you. If you tell me you want to do A, B, and C, and I'm sitting here going. No, but we do A, B, and C. Why don't you know about it? And then it's like, let's let's try to figure that out. It can be frustrating. I get that. I mean, I think we have great staff that work really hard to promote events and activities, but at some point there's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. We have to acknowledge that there's a disconnect and then figure out how to work around it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's a, a really important, such an important point and such a kind of great segue as we think about our staff, right, who are doing all of this work, who are God bless them. I mean, people in higher ed have not, they have worked so hard if, as we've had conversations about um, in the past, Dan, so hard in the last couple of years. You know, I'm seeing a lot of um, resignations from colleagues. It's quite honestly a little heartbreaking because these are really good people, Dan, who are so good at what they do and we're just losing some incredible talent. Um, you know, as we wrap up, just you mentor, you supervise advice about supporting our staff um, and teams as we move into um, the next fall semester. Yeah, I, I, um, I, I think we have to recognize that when we sent everybody home and it feels like forever ago when we did that in March of 20, uh, there, was, there was trauma associated with that because we just didn't send our people home. Um, they got sent home, their students, their, their young, their kids got sent home, their partners and spouses got sent home. Um, people were trying to figure out how to support um, students' online learning. Um, you know, some, some folks had elder care that they were now responsible for. Um, some folks had partners who lost jobs and some people lost their lives. And, and all at the same time, we were like, hey, we gotta be online, we gotta be available for our students. And, and that was a lot. I mean, I, I, I think, I, I feel like we, we did a decent job in trying to support folks. I think we learned a lot in the first couple of months and maybe changed how we supervised people and provided space for people to do that work. But then the reality is, is when we came back to campus, there was another form of trauma because we were asking people to come back to campus in you know, the summer of uh, 21, and some folks didn't have childcare yet. Um, they were still dealing with, you know, lost wages. Some folks were still dealing with um, the passing of family members. Some folks were still dealing with elder care. Um, and there was this need to get back to air quotes normal, which meant everybody should be back on campus. Um, and I, I think it, um, it's, we need to ask ourselves, how do we support our staff having gone through all this? Um, and so I think, Programs that come up with providing opportunities for alternative work arrangements um, is important. Um, but likewise, I think we also have to remind ourselves we're not still in the pandemic for the most part. 
um, and students are back on campus now. So it's not like we're providing alternative work events when there's no students on campus. Our students are back full force and they want to be here. Um, but our staff and our faculty are looking for opportunities for flexibility. And so I think that's a creative balance. Um, I think we have an obligation to make sure that we're, we're paying folks, you know, the right, the right wages. And that's always a little challenging as well, depending on your resources. Um, but the reality is, is people aren't going to go back to what it was before because what, the, what it was before, there's this reality now that maybe it wasn't the best that it could have been. And they're looking for something that's better. So I, I think what, what I try to tell people is let's be open to, to some flexibility. Let's see what we can do. Um, let's remember that the work that we're being asked to do is, is student facing, um, at least in student affairs. And so while we may not necessarily be able to all work from home on Mondays and Fridays, <laughs> you know, we, may, we have to balance that out uh, across the staff and across the delivery of our programs and services. Um, certain departments may not be able to do that. They may have to wait until, you know, uh, summer when their departments aren't as busy as other departments. You know, that doesn't include orientation, but it may include some of the other departments that would in the purview. Um, so I think it's a really just about keeping an open mind and some flexibility, uh, recognizing that people will do good work uh, when they feel valued and supported. Um, so how do you demonstrate that value and support? I think the other part of this, Megan, and this is probably another webinar altogether, but you know, there was so much that was happening in, in areas of social justice and diversity and inclusion in the summer of 2019. So many you know, different issues were, were being spotlighted and, and given attention that they weren't being given before. And I think, I don't know for us, we, as a division, we had begun to have some of those conversations. The next thing we know, the next thing we know, is we then went into all these, these conversations about this new virus that was coming up. And so not only did we come back this year unpacking issues around fairness and trauma and coming back to work, but it was also, hey, wait a second, what about those other issues about social justice and equity and inclusion? Those haven't done any work. And, and, and in fact, the pandemic just shined even more concerns about uh, those issues. So um, I think as leaders, we have to take, realize that there's multiple conversations or multiple pandemics that we have to be processing and unpacking with our staff. And um, it, it's hard work, but it's needed work. Um, because I think if people know that it matters to the institution or at least to the division that you'll be willing to have those conversations, they might be willing to give us a, a chance to stay with us a little bit longer before just resigning and moving on. And, and Dan, I mean, as I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm really struck by the importance of communication. I mean, I feel like that has been a spotlight that has been shown large in, in, in this pandemic, right? And that if we, we want our staff, in fact, our, our staff, and I'm specifically thinking about our student services folks right now, to feel valued, um, to, to feel recognized in the work that we're doing, um, I like that being creative, being flexible, but listening. I mean, and you know, and not that we can deliver everything to everybody, right? And and you're right, we're student facing. It's important we're there for students. Um, but when I feel heard, I feel valued um, mm -hmm. in the work that I do by my leadership team. Well, and demonstrating that it doesn't have to be an added on conversation. So this, you know, in our case, we meet with our directors as a large group every two weeks. And so this year, I've just committed that, you know, a portion of that two hour time together every two weeks will be dedicated to doing some of these conversations. So it doesn't have to be an added on conversation. You just weave it into existing meetings. And so, you know, that recognition that people are just, they're kind of tired and exhausted. And so trying to find another time to have a, a, a important conversation, it's more about, well, let's make time now while we have time already scheduled and let's not make this an add on. Let's just make it a part of who we are. Who we are. I love that. Stan, as always, I learned so much from you. I've taken pages of notes here, um, you know, about, about the importance of sitting with our students, giving them space. Um, these groups that you met with are, you know, students in recovery, our veterans, 
our first gen, I mean, those are often students in my experience who don't feel like they have a space um, like on our campus. So thank you for the important work you're doing, Dan. Thank you. It's always a joy to sit with you and, and just have a conversation and hopefully it's been helpful to those that have, have joined us as well. Yeah, I'm sure it had. Um, next um, month, August the 19th, I'm going to talk to Jessica Gifford, um, who's doing a lot of work around creating connection to help students um, work through um, feelings of isolation, loneliness, depression um, in institutions. And so I'm really um, interested. I feel like um, your conversation is a really nice segue um, into that discussion about some um, projects that institutions are taking on to really address student loneliness and isolation. So I'm excited to learn from her. Dan, thank you so much for your time. And on a Friday, um, as in the summer, as you get ready to head off for, for NASPA um, meetings, I'm really, really grateful to you. And I just really appreciate all that you share with our audience. Um, we always come away with such important messages. So thank you, Dan. Wow, thank you for your time and thank you for having me. Everybody have a great weekend. May there be time for rest and renewal. Feel well. Thanks, Dan. Thank you.